Welcome back to our third video in our series of geometry and design tutorials. In this, in this session, we're going to look at triangles and, and why they're important. And that might seem sort of odd in a series about pre-industrial geometric furniture design because you don't honestly see a ton of triangular furniture. But triangles as geometric constructions form such fundamental building blocks to other geometric figures that we're going to see that we use them all the time in our designs, even though they might not appear as actual design elements and components of, of furniture. And so the very first proposition, the very first statement to be proven in Book 1 of Euclid's Elements has to do with equilateral triangles. Remember, an equilateral triangle <clears throat> is just a trilateral figure that has three straight line edges. So proposition one of book one is to construct an equilateral triangle on the straight line AB. So Euclid's saying it's possible. Euclid's saying that if you are given some line that connects the points A and B. We know that line is always possible to construct. So if you're, if you're given a line like that, And Euclid tells you that it's possible to construct an equilateral triangle where that's one of its sides and the other two sides share the same length. Here's how you do it. You set compass to the measure of A and B and you produce two circles. One circle is going to have A as its center and AB as its radius. And then the other one is going to have B as its center and AB as its radius. And those circles are going to intersect. In fact, they intersect at two places, but we'll just pick one of them and we'll label that point of intersection C. And so then, if we draw a line connecting A and C, and a line connecting B and C, then that gives us a triangle ABC. Triangle ABC. And Euclid claims that that triangle is equilateral, meaning the length of that segment equals the length of that segment and equals the length of that segment. Now it's important to understand that so far we've just shown you a technique. It's, it's not a proof. We don't know for sure yet that those line segments should be equal. So in order to complete this proposition, we have to offer the proof that this construction is correct, that it, it results in the figure that we want, namely an equilateral triangle where one side is AB. Well, here's how the proof works. We notice that AB and AC 
are radii of the same circle. Circle, this circle right here, centered at point A. And since they're radii of the same circle, by, by definition of what a circle is, this line segment has to be the same length as this line segment. Because all lines that start at the center of a circle and go to its perimeter have to be the same. And likewise, AB, same segment, is a radii of this other a radius of this other circle, the one centered at B. But so is BC. So I know that AB and BC have to be equal. So let's, let's summarize that. From the first circle, we know that AB equals AC. From the second circle, we know AB equals BC. This radius of this circle equals this radius of this circle. And so we can then conclude that AC equals BC from common notion one. Because if a thing is equal to, in this case, we've got a line segment that's equal to segment AB. We've got another line segment that's equal to segment AB. So these two line segments must be equal as well because they're equal to the same thing. And that's enough to convince us that this triangle is equilateral because all three of these line segments are equal to each other. And so that's an example of how you would prove a postulate. We're going to look at several postulates from Euclidean geometry from the elements. We're only going to prove a few of them. We're going to prove the most critical ones where doing so is going to maybe have a chance of giving us some greater insight in how it works, what it means, and why it's important. But for the remainder of this session, we have no more postulates that we're going to prove. We just have several that we're going to look at. But before we can get there, it's worth saying something about postulate one. I mean, there's a reason why it's the first postulate in, in Euclid's elements. It's, it's one of the most important in terms of its applications. So it matters for a lot of reasons. First of all, there are direct applications of it in furniture design, I suppose. A simple application might be that you are building a small three-legged stool between the legs and you've got to figure out where you're going to put the holes in the seat of your stool so that they're spaced evenly uh, for the legs to go through. Well it could well be that you want those to go into an equilateral triangle pattern where the holes form the corners of the triangle. There's some other more important, I'd, I'd argue that there are more important applications though as well. Um, they may be indirect, but they're very important. So in future tutorials, we're going to use postulate one as a step in the arguments that we, we establish for making constructions of bisected lines. What do we do if we want to take a line segment and cut it into two equal parts? We're going to use this construction. What if we want to take an angle and bisect it into two equal angles? we're going to use essentially this construction. What if we want to construct two lines that are perpendicular to each other? That's a really important goal for furniture design because perpendicular lines or right angles are everywhere in much of the furniture we design. Just look at your kitchen cabinets and bookshelves and objects like that. We're going to use this construction to lay out lines like that. So you really need to be able to do and understand this construction in order to get very far in Euclidean geometry and pre-industrial design. So we're going to spend some more time looking at 
not proving, but just looking at some postulates, I keep saying postulates, looking at some propositions about line segments and then more on triangles. And that'll wrap up this tutorial. These are going to be utility propositions that we use as we're building up our more sophisticated design techniques for pre-industrial furniture design. So I'm going to list off two, the next two propositions of Euclidean geometry. So proposition two of book one says to place a straight line equal to a given straight line with one end at a given point. Don't worry if that sounds incomprehensible. Then proposition three says to cut off the greater of two unequal straight lines in a straight line equal to the less. What these together are essentially telling you, so I'm going to restate what they really mean for us, is that suppose you've got geometric figure that maybe has a, a link, the line segment and part of it, and another line segment here. It's constructively possible to take the shorter, of the, well, to take either of them, but to take the shorter of these two line segments and transfer it onto the other line segment and cut it, cut it off and erase it or cut it and just mark it as a dimension. And that's what those two somewhat obtusely stated propositions do for us. So that it's essentially telling us that in Euclidean geometry, it's constructively permissible to copy and transfer lengths of line segments from one part of your figure to the other. And that's going to be massively important for us when we are doing, I mean, think back to the stool design that was featured in the first tutorial. We decided to lay out that stool inside of a bounding rectangle that had its width in, its, in a uh, four to three ratio with its height. And we were able to establish that bounding rectangle by taking some dimension, copying it onto the width and the height four times and three times respectively. So these two propositions together, even though they don't seem like it on the surface, tell us that you can transfer distances in Euclidean geometry. And the tool we use for that is the compass. We can set the compass to a distance and then we can model the process of transferring it. Now, you wouldn't realize that that's what was going on if you read the proofs of proposition, propositions two and three casually, but that's the implication of these and that's how we will use them. Our next few propositions are a little different from some of the others that we've, the few others that we've looked at so far. And before we get into what they are, maybe it's more important to think about what they're for. A lot of times in a design application, in a furniture or architectural design application, you might want to establish or determine or test that two line segments in your design or two angles in your design are actually equal to each other. It's a pretty common task to need to be able to, to complete. 
and you could approximately determine that two line segments are equal to each other, I suppose, by just setting your compass to the distance between the endpoints of one line and kind of holding it up to the endpoints of the other. And there's similar techniques you could use for um, angles, but if you really wanted to prove it, you'd need more than that. And that's really what these, these, um, these next four propositions, we're going to take them out of order a little bit, do for us. But they do it by imagining that those line segments or angles form the sides or angles of, of triangles. I'm not going to state these definitions, these, <laughs> I'm not going to state these propositions uh, using the same translated language from Euclid. We're going to rethink them in a different way. And the reason for that is that Euclid, the first, first of the three that we're going to look at is Proposition 4 of Book 1. And Euclid proved that proposition using a technique, a structure, that actually isn't a part of Euclidean geometry. He had never established it as a definition or a postulate or even a common notion. And it's a concept called superposition that we're really not going to worry about in the context of these tutorials. It's just the main thing that you need to understand is that it, it wasn't a part of Euclidean geometry. So he went outside of Euclidean geometry, outside of his own system, to prove this fourth proposition. And by modern standards, by modern way of thinking about geometry, this, this really wouldn't be um, a valid way of, of, of doing things. You'd want to take this concept of superposition that Euclid used and state it as a, probably as a, as, a, as a postulate. If you throw it away, it turns out, and this has been shown, it turns out that it's impossible to prove postulate, prove pop proposition four in terms of the other things that exist within Euclidean geometry. What you can prove is that Proposition 4, and then two others, Propositions 8 and 26, are all logically equivalent to one another. And what that means is that if you assume any one of them to be true, you can prove the other two. And so for this reason, what we usually do in modern treatments of geometry is take those three propositions and state them as a postulate that's just really a congruence or an equivalence class of, of three different postulates. And what I mean by that is that we just state, look, if you, if you assume any one of these, then you get the other two right along with them. As I said, I'm not going to state these using Euclid's language. I'm going to state them in terms that are probably more familiar to many of you, especially if you've ever even had a high school geometry class. What these propositions really establish for us are four different triangle congruence theorems. The side angle side theorem, the side 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 theorem, the angle side angle theorem, and the angle angle side theorem. And what all of these have in common is that they tell you if you can establish that some, not all of the components of a triangle, some of the sides and angles are equal to the sides and angles of another triangle, then all of the remaining corresponding sides and angles of the, between those two triangles are equal to each other as well. And that can be a technique that you can use to establish that a line segment somewhere in your design is equal to another line segment elsewhere in the design, or the same for two angles that appear in your design. Here's how they work. Proposition four of book one is the side angle side relationship. And it states that if you've got two triangles, oh, that looks terrible. Those triangles each have two sides corresponding to each other that are equal, meaning this side is equal to this side, 
this side is equal to this side. And also, the angle that lies between those pairs of corresponding sides, those angles are equal to one another. If you can show that, then you can conclude that the remaining sides of the triangles are equal and the remaining corresponding angles are equal. So you get that the whole triangles are equal. Well, the eighth proposition of book one of the elements gives us side-side-side relationship between triangles. And it's similar. It states that if you've got two triangles and you know that each of the three pairs of corresponding sides are equal to one another, this side equals this side, this side equals this side, and this side equals this side, then you can conclude that the remaining corresponding parts of those triangles are also equal. This angle equals this angle, this one equals this one, this one equals this one. So those three pairs of sides is enough to buy the three pairs of angles, equalities of those angles for you. So that's the side, side, side relationship. Well, there's two more. And they all come, or they both come as part of the remaining of these three postulates. Propositions. Terrible. I keep calling them postulates. Proposition 26 of Book 1 establishes the two angles in a side relationship between two triangles. And there's actually two different ways this proposition gives us to establish equality or congruence between two triangles. First, imagine you've got your two triangles. And those triangles have one set of corresponding angles that are equal, another set of corresponding angles that you know to be equal, and then the side that falls between those pairs of corresponding angles on both triangles. You know that happens to be equal. Those happen to be equal. If you know those three pieces of information about these two triangles, then you can conclude that the remaining corresponding parts of the triangles are, are equal. So this side equals this side, this side equals this side, and this angle equals this angle. And that's what's more commonly known as the angle side angle relationship. But there's another way to establish equality or congruence between two triangles if you know something about two angles and a side between those triangles. If you've got your two triangles, and once again, this angle is equal to this corresponding angle, this angle is equal to this corresponding angle, and now you've got a side that does not lie in between those two angles. It lies outside of the two angles, yet it equals the corresponding side on the other triangle. Then that is enough to establish that all of the remaining corresponding parts of those triangles are equal to each other. So this angle has to equal this angle. This side has to equal this side, and this side has to equal this side. That is the angle-angle side congruence relationship for triangles. And so 
those three propositions, which give us four different congruence relationships, can be very powerful in helping us to establish when two different line segments in a design are equal to one another, or two different angles in a design are equal to one another. They just tell us that we've got to, that one approach could be that we try to embed those line segments or angles into two triangles that we know enough about to be able to gather information like what we see in the angle side angle relationship or angle angle side relationship or side angle side or side side side. And then we can often get the equivalence between those line segments or angles that we're, we're looking for. So now we're almost done with this session. We've got two more propositions to look at that serve a similar purpose, except they explore what's happening with isosceles triangles beyond what was given to us in the definition. Remember, the definition of an isosceles triangle was that it's a triangle that has exactly two sides that are equal to one another, but not three, like you would see in an equilateral. So the first of these is Proposition 5 of Book 1. And again, I won't prove these. I'm just going to state them. And what it says is that in isosceles triangles, the angles at the base equal one another, and if the straight lines are produced further, or if the equal straight sides are produced further, then the angles under the base equal one another. So let's illustrate that with a picture. some triangle that I'm going to force to be isosceles by marking out two equal distances on two legs of an angle and then connecting the endpoints of those distances. So I know that distance from here to here, the distance from here to here are equal because of the way that I drew it. So that results in an isosceles triangle, this part right here. What Proposition 5 of Book 1 tells us is that, look, if we know that triangle is isosceles, then this angle has to equal this angle. It's not just the sides, it's the base angles that are also equal. And furthermore, if you extend these equal sides of the isosceles triangle on further, then these angles on the other side of the base of that isosceles triangle, they have to be equal to one another as well. Well, proposition six of book one, I'm gonna need this, tells us something else. It says, if in a triangle two angles equal one another, then the sides opposite those equal angles are equal to one another. And so it says, um, I'll draw this picture. Let's imagine we've got a triangle. That's what this, this postulate is assuming. That's what this proposition is assuming. It says if you've got a triangle that's drawn in such a way that two angles in that triangle are equal to one another, then you can conclude that the, the side opposite of one angle is equal to the side opposite the other of those two angles. And of course, what that means is that this triangle must be isosceles. 
Okay, and so if we put those two propositions together with the definition of an isosceles triangle, then we, what we can compactly say is that an, a, 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 a triangle is isosceles if and only if exactly two of its sides are equal to each other or if and only if exactly two of its angles are equal to one another. All right, so equal sides or equal angles are all we need to check or test for an isosceles triangle. And since isosceles triangles have equal, two equal sides and two equal base angles in them, if you can put two angles that you are hoping to be equal from a geometric uh, construction, into an isosceles triangle, then it's en that's enough for you to determine that they're equal. And the same is true with line segments. So it's a little bit more of a specialized tool, but this idea of an isosceles triangle can be used to establish equality of line segments or angles, just like we saw with the, um, the triangle congruence propositions. And so that's probably enough for this, this session. In the next sessions, we're going to look at a few more sets of propositions. The next one, we're going to look at how we can take either an angle or a line and bisect it into equal parts. After that, we're finally going to get to one of the most critical constructions that we, we will develop in, in, in this series. And that's going to be how to lay out two lines that are perpendicular to each other. And it sounds to me like my goats are getting restless and brushing up against the outside of my shop. Thanks for joining me.